Hi, and welcome to Boom It's on the Blockchain. My name's uh, Alistair Caithness, and we've got a special guest with us today, Peter Gaffney. How are you, Peter? What's going on, Alistair? I'm good. I'm good. I'm having a great week. Hope the same for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's all good. It's been raining in San Diego there for once, you know, so um, you can't always get the sunshine. You're out in Miami, are you, Peter? Yeah, we're all good. It's nice and sunny out there right now, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we're heading to that season, so things are good. Perfect, perfect. So for people who are not aware, Peter is head of research for security token market. You know, security tokens have been uh, increasing in relevance. Um, the company security token market, I've been following them since 2018, 2019, when I started to get involved in the space. They're probably the leaders out there in terms of providing information on the market space. And Peter is head of research. So just to kick things off then, Peter, can you give a bit of background about yourself and uh, how you got in the position you're in? Sure. <clears throat> so back in, let's say, 2017, discovered uh, crypto, like most people, not an uncommon story. Um, but I remember, you know, we were kind of running like an, alter an investment fund just solely for digital assets to take it a bit more seriously. Uh, look at, you know, different alts and kind of how things are trading, different strategies and just kind of take it to the next level of fintech. I think that was a natural progression. Remember getting airdropped a bunch of polymath token. Uh, so I had to look up, obviously, what is polymath? Realize, wow, we could do um, use the technology that we've been working with Bitcoin, Ethereum up until that point with kind of real estate and like private equity i thought that was an awesome concept um obviously it took a, took a little bit to kind of solidify more um and so from that time up until a couple of years ago um was working primarily early on in the private equity space at the healthcare real estate startup pe firm um and then moved over to global x etfs had a lot of thematic kind of niche tech products which i thought were really cool really awesome and it was good to see kind of what the appetite was of those type of like fintech and biotech um, and just thematic products as a whole. And so kind of after seeing both sides of that, if you have uh, like the private equity side, the ETF wrapper, publicly traded side, if you marry those things together, that's kind of tokenization in a nutshell, or at least the future vision that, that I have for tokenization. Um, and so that kind of led me to security token advisors and security token market as a whole. And we're now, I kind of lead a lot of, as you uh, hinted at before, lead a lot of the research initiatives, kind of industry-wide reporting, um, a lot of coverage for our advisory clients and kind of insights on the secondary market side alike. Yeah, so, you know, I know Kyle and Herwig not too well, but I've spoken to them on the phone a few times in the past. And, you know, they, they run a podcast out there as well that specifically focuses on the security token market. So we'll leave information below if any of the viewers are coming in from crypto or blockchain and sure. don't know yeah. about this the space itself. And it's really good. You know, I, I follow this online as well. So I get a lot of my information from what these guys are talking about. So let's just bring it back to, for people to understand is, you know, people have heard of ICOs, initial coin offerings, and now there's these STOs, security token offerings. Can you explain the difference and why ICOs are sort of on the downside and security tokens are on the, you know, the acceleration upside? Definitely. So in, let's say, 2017, 2018, especially the ICO boom, a lot of people that have at least been in the industry for, let's call it five years, are pretty familiar with. But that was essentially when um, a lot of kind of fly by night companies and not all of them are bad, but a, a lot of these ICOs were just kind of, you know, organizations issuing these digital tokens, pumping them up on kind of media channels and marketing channels, um, creating followings and saying, hey, we're going to do this, this and that with the proceeds. We're going to solve this problem. We're going to solve this. We're going to invest in this. We're going to dish out dividends to the investors, whatever. Um, so they were raising, I forget, I forget the number, a ton of capital just kind of on these overnight initial coin offerings. Uh, but there were no protections. It was not done compliantly. It was not done according to any SEC laws. Uh, probably not, you know, abroad internationally with every jurisdiction these companies are falling into. But there were thousands of ICOs. Um, and so a ton of capital was raised. Investors had really no protection, just kind of banking on the word of this issue and company whom they've never met. They just happened to maybe see on uh, Twitter or see on LinkedIn or see on uh, Telegram or something like that. So that became a major issue, especially because um, they're essentially unregistered securities. So one, it was cool to see the power because it was like 
the original crowdfunding in the crypto space. And it definitely found product market fit, a ton of capital was flowing in. So it was crazy to see from that perspective. But on the other end, when things started kind of hitting the fan, um, especially in 2018, as the crypto market started taking that downward turn, um, you know, a lot of these investors had no protections. And so people were just kind of raising capital with ICOs and they're running away with the proceeds. And so even from, you know, this year, even last year, 2022, 2023, now companies that issued ICOs back in 2017 and 18 are still getting served and prosecuted by the SEC now for fraud and for unregistered securities selling. So where does that bring us to on the security token side? That's essentially where you're doing everything by the book. You're bringing in proper legal groups. You're filing an SEC exemption, whether maybe a, a regulation D to offer an investment uh, to offer an investment to U.S. accredited investors and maybe represent their equity ownership or similar, whatever the instrument is with a digital security um, built on blockchain, much like an ICO would be, um, but compliantly. Or we're even taking it a step further. We're having retail based offerings also done by the book under regulation A+. Um, super you know, stringent with the SEC. So companies that do it well, like Exodus, for example, um, that's you know totally by the book and that's a great example. Um, and then we're kind of seeing more flexibility, just anything you know across different jurisdictions in Europe, in Asia, especially those are popular areas to complement the US. Um, so essentially just kind of using the same technology, but working with licensed parties and using the proper legal filings. Yeah. So, so for um, explain to people a little bit more about like the difference between sort of regulation D and regulation A and how many token offerings traditionally were originally going in under regulation D, but you spoke about one doing reg A there. So where do you see the market developing from there, Peter? Sure. Yeah. No, great question. So reg D is still, and we see a lot of this on our advisory side or research side, whatever reg D is still the, the, quickest to market. All you have to do really is file, not to speak out of term, but all you have to do is really, you know, file, file a reg D, which is a filing notice. And as long as you have your assets on board, you have your team ready and you have, let's say the offering set up um, with either a platform, an issuance platform or a broker dealer or whatever, you can raise capital from accredited investors right away almost. Um, so that's still the kind of the go-to. And we see, we see ticket minimums from as low as like a thousand dollars for a minimum buy-in all the way up to a hundred grand, um, 500 grand in certain cases, depending on what the case is. But again, the SEC, you know, when you come to the accredited status, it's assumed that you're a pretty sophisticated investor. You know what you're doing, yada, yada. We kind of know how the language is there. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it's, it's less stringent when you're looking at a reg A plus or a reg A offering. That's when you could raise up to fifty million dollars for tier one, or or seventy five million dollars tier two reggae offering um, from retail investors. So when the retail you know guys and girls are involved, the SEC gets a bit more stringent, a bit more uptight, which is totally fine. But it also means the legal process is longer, uh, more costly. It requires more, let's say, audited financials and ongoing reporting, which also has its own costs and its own kind of laundry list of of items associated with that which is why it's a bit less common. And we see a ton of people that want to raise capital retail. Um, we actually have a, a client from the Secure Token Advisor side, uh, Freeport. They're going live, you know, I think it's later this spring or summer. They're doing fractional museum quality arts. They have like a, an Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe painting, They're fractionalizing that. The shares will be issued under Reg A provision. Um, like I said, sometime this summer, I believe. So that would be a great example because that would be something that um, like a reggae offering that hasn't been seen in, in quite some time in the market. Before this, I mentioned Exodus. That's a crypto digital asset wallet. Been around since I think 2015. Back in 2019 or 2020, they did file the reggae. They ended up raising $75 million total. So they maxed out that reggae plus tier two offering from a blend of retail accredited and institutional investors. So that's really like the full range of power, right? Raising capital from not just banks, not just big asset managers, not private equity funds, not VC funds, not just high net worth groups, but also retail, AKA maybe the Exodus users. Um, and that's kind of the whole pinnacle of, you know, of what ICOs want it to be, but really of what security token offerings are, being able to raise from your user base, from your crowd, uh, and to kind of be a little more tapped in there. But in summary, the Reg D right now for accredited is still kind of the easiest to market, um, which is why most of the offerings now, which are in the hundreds, um, are done via Reg D. 
a lot of prospects and a lot of desire to go reggae, but it's just a bit more stringent and can take longer with the SEC to get that approved. Okay. So you were talking one about like this uh, Freeport and mm -hmm. they're working with art. Now, a lot of people obviously, and this happened in lockdown there with Bored Apes and NFTs and this sort of uh, hashing um, corporate, or, you know, copyright ownership on the blockchain. But explain a little bit about how STOs are different from NFTs so people can understand that. Because most people will know what an NFT is, but will not know what an STO is. But you're now speaking about an STO essentially doing something similar to what an NFT can do in terms of ownership. Sure. Yeah. So like we've seen NFT, one of the prime cases, use cases for that is with art. Like you mentioned the Board Ape um, Yacht Club uh, collection. Let's say so all digital art. So in this case, uh, what Freeport is doing is actually holding the physical Andy Warhol, um, hence the name Freeport. That's kind of, you know, where a lot of these high quality art pieces are stored. Um, but they're holding that and they're just issuing, they will be issuing securities representing equity investments in fractions of the art. So rather than an NFT, which is more so like a one of one, I just, I own this. I have the ability to use this. I have the IP rights. This is more of simply an investment vehicle, an investment purpose. So I'm going to hold a fraction, let's say one tenth of the, the Marilyn Monroe painting, Andy Warhol. Um, and I'm just going to collect whatever, or I'm just going to, you know, revalue and collect any distributions of any future sales, or just kind of hold it as part of my, my assets, my personal assets. Whereas if it was an NFT, maybe I have the NFT to this painting, I could show like I own the entire thing. It's not necessarily an investment purpose. I'm not generating any revenues or anything like that. I just kind of have it to document my ownership on chain, which is why a lot of NFTs are primarily for digital pieces for just like, you know, online graphics um, and not as much used for real world assets. And that's a whole a whole new theme of 2023 is the idea of real world assets on chain. Um, and I think that's what people wanted NFTs to be. But the reality is when you bring a lot of physical property on blockchain, it looks like a security. And whether, you know, whether you stand more so with the crypto side or more so with the traditional finance side, at the end of the day, everyone's answering to the SEC. Um, and the easy answer from their part is, oh, it's it's a security, um, which is why I think what Freeport is doing and what a lot of these other companies are doing is so important by working with Regulation A plus or Regulation D guidelines to ensure whether I think it's a security or not, at least I am issuing it like it would be one. And that's a lot of upside protection or rather downside protection that um, the NFT issuers from the past three years probably don't have. Yeah, so, so you're speaking there about tokenization of physical assets. So, and this is the key behind essentially the whole process. Can you explain the benefits of tokenization of physical assets? I know real estate is probably the first industry to go into it. So maybe some examples so people can understand it. Yeah, real estate is like the most commonly touted one. Um, I prefer to look at honestly like private investment funds, and that's the most fun side to me. But let's say in real estate, a lot of people look at it and they say, "Hey, I'm a general partner in a real estate investment fund. I, you know, I have LPs. Let's say I have ten different LPs, limited partners. They want me to sell a property that I've been managing for let's say five years. They two more years they want me to sell. So they want their seven year timeline. They want to flip it, be done." maybe reinvest in a new fund, but overall they want to collect their distributions. It's kind of inefficient. If I'm having a good time managing the property, if I see upside, if I see upside, let's say I'm managing in Miami and I see upside for the next five, 10 years, I don't want to have to you know, be forced to sell something in the next two years. That's kind of cutting my own upside. So what we could do is we could actually tokenize this. We could put something into a special purpose vehicle like an LLC or a similar um, entity structure. It could own this property. I can actually tokenize, digitize basically the cap table of this new um, vehicle. And then that would basically represent my LP interest. So let's say my 10 LPs would get their prorated distributions, whatever they had invested originally. Um, and that's how things would be managed. So instead of holding things like paper documents, now we all just do this with 
tokens that are on the blockchain, which is really just a ledger, a way to manage things. So rather than having, let's say, 10 different Excel sheets to all manage this or look at the same data and property, we have one singular trusted ledger. I won't manipulate it. You know, my LPs won't do any funny business on their bookkeeping. It's all just a shared ledger. And it's always going to be correct because we all have the same copy and any changes that happen to it, we all see it. And that's like the whole you know ethos of blockchain to start. So where am I going with this? When we tokenize this asset now, if I'm, I'm still the GP, if people are pressuring me to sell, I'll say, no problem. This is all tokenized. It's all fractionalized and on chain. I could go list it with a marketplace or I could go list it with a broker dealer, list it with an alternative trading system to offer either peer to peer swaps in which the LPs could swap amongst each other. If one wants to maybe sell their entire allocation or some, they can sweat and find another buyer right there. They could do that. It could be a bulletin board style approach where we find certain prospective LPs that may have interest in coming into the deal and then same deal existing LPs could swap out directly with them or we could list it on an alternative trading system, which is a secondary market, but a regulated one with the SEC and with FINRA, where we could actually have secondary buyers, potentially retail investors buying up super small amounts. And so this as the GP, I'm still managing my property. That's all I care about. But now my cap table, which was already tokenized, is always going to be correct because it's on chain. So any change of hands, any change of ownership is always going to be immediately reflected on that. And that just gets auto updated. So whether I'm using approach number one, where we have existing LP swapping together, any swaps, boom, right back to the blockchain, that'll be updated. The cap table will always be correct. Same deal, any new investors that come in, boom, any changes of hands, the cap table will be updated. Same deal again with option three on the, the ATS side, any trades, any changes of hand of ownership, boom, the cap table will be reflected. And so the end goal here is that as the GP, I don't need to sell. I give my LPs the ability to sell. I'm not pressured to sell. Um, so anyone who wants to hold it out to the very end with me can get the, that final distribution. But if not, they do have new avenues of liquidity. And so what becomes really powerful, and actually uh, my team on the data side just published this this past week, is looking at these real estate tokens that trade on secondary markets like um, the St. Regis Aspen, which is Aspen coin, like all these realty properties, which are kind of, you know, government subsidies housing across the U.S. And there's 200 something of them. Um, and then a few other, you know, land share and a few other portfolio companies and even on the commercial real estate side. When you look at how these trade, since it's based on supply and demand on the secondary markets, they trade pretty rapidly. The order books are not super, super thick yet. And we could get into that in a bit. But when you look at this, you're having price swings up to 10, 20, 30, 40 percent, sometimes month over month. And, you know, the underlying real estate asset probably isn't marking that differently. Right. Over the course of a month or two or three. And this gives you a lot of trading opportunities. So to come back to the original story, if I'm an LP and I see that, I see my properties at a premium of 30% right now. I don't need to wait two more years. I don't even need to wait, you know, five years, two years, six months, whatever. I could sell right then and there and collect my premium. So I think that's the real powerful piece at the end of the day is that ultimately liquidity and kind of the, the secondary trading aspect. So that was one good answer, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's good because I've got a few questions come off the back of what you said there. The first one is, let's <laughs> talk about funds because I feel that 2023... I know you guys have been speaking about funds as well, tokenized funds, you know, and there's a lot of fund managers out there and they're all looking at this blockchain and this new technology coming out. So what's the benefits of them from traditionally running a fund to suddenly running a tokenized fund? Yeah. So the, um, the most prominent examples right now that all came between like September and January of last year and this year um, were KKR and Hamilton Lane specifically. And KKR issued a feeder fund basically on one on their flagship healthcare fund with Securitize, a registered SEC registered broker dealer that does, does digital securities. Um, Hamilton Lane did a couple funds with Securitize as well, and then also issued kind of digitally native 40 act fund share classes um, with figure and the provenance blockchain. So separate service provider blockchain but same company and so what these firms did the two of them they saw their 
average buy-in amounts dip by anywhere from 90% all the way up to like 99.8%. The typical fund buy-ins, just managing things traditionally, were $5 million. So any investors that wanted to get in to any of these funds had to fork up 5 mil. Whereas on chain, when you're managing these investors, like our story before, the cap table always reflects correctly at the end of the day, at the end of any transaction, in fact, because the underlying blockchain settlement mechanism does that. You don't need to increase your back office to manage trades, to reconcile trades. You don't need to increase your manpower to manage all the Excel sheets or any differences like that, even to communicate between different uh, investor parties. Everything is just done on chain. So when you look at it that way, you could kind of manage 10,000 investors the same way you manage 10 investors. So if I'm a fund manager and I'm already tapping into my usual pools of capital, we see how the macro picture is. I may have to come into new streams and kind of go lower and lower down the chain from institutional capital to, let's say, private banking to high net worth and wealth management, um, eventually down even maybe to the retail level. So when you look at it that way, it's going to be difficult to manage all of those new investors and smaller checks to fulfill your obligations or your capital you know, desires. Um, but you can do it with tokenization pretty seamlessly. So that's to bring it back again. That's kind of where I think Hamilton Lane, KKR have been looking. And when you can lower your minimum buy-in amount from $5 million to $20,000 or even $10,000, you open your pool up to a way, way bigger um, selection size, if you will. And so even if you're still open to accredited or qualified purchasers, it's a whole new cohort of accreds and qualified purchasers that can get in. And so that's the whole goal. So as a fund manager, you're kind of doing that. And then by nature, when you do have you know, a wider range of investors like that, should you want to offer that liquidity perspective that we talked about in the real estate example, or even if you want to facilitate redemptions a bit more efficiently, um, you can do that. And I think the most common example is when you looked at Blackstone's BREIT, um, their real estate income trust. I think they maxed out their redemptions back in January or February. They actually had, I think it was like $5 billion worth of requests, but they could only honor up to 5% a quarter. And 5 billion of 69 billion was like 7.2%. So they simply couldn't honor 2.2% uh, of those. If you had a mechanism in place where things were tokenized and you could offer that bulletin board thing that we kind of mentioned before and allow investors to kind of find price discovery amongst each other. If I'm Blackstone, I can manage my business as usual, hands off, and still enable that extra 2.2% in capital to kind of match each other between buyers and sellers. Um, and my books wouldn't change, right? So that's kind of also a different motivation. I know that goes a little bit deeper, but that's something that I think a lot of fund managers will consider moving forward. Yeah, it's a bit like democratization of ownership. I like that expression in terms of suddenly through tokenization, security tokens, it can, it's opening up the pool of people to invest into these essentially asset classes that they've never been able to invest in before. Right. I think one of the, you know, I know a few fund managers. I think one of their fears is, you know, there's, there's quite often like a three-year, five-year lockup period uh, to invest into certain funds. Mm -hmm. If you were going to invest in a tokenized fund, how can you ensure the lockup period lasts before they can actually just sell the tokens? How does that work? And yeah, that's some, one of the key things about tokenization. It's all, it's mostly smart contract driven. So let's say, Alistair, you buy in. Um, and I want to lock you up for three years. I can co I could either code into the smart contract directly of the token and say, hey, this token will not trade hands for a minimum of 36 months, even down to the day, down to the second. So that let's say midnight on year three, uh, day one, you can trade. Or some of the companies and service providers in the space can do that via APIs off chain if they want to manage whatever and just call it in. There's multiple, multiple ways to handle it. But the key is that, yeah, it's it's a pretty um, key facet of things. And so even when you looked at, we talked about Reg D and Reg A before, Reg A has no lockup period. So as soon as you, you know, if you're in the primary round, you're raising capital, boom, 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 you could list right away on a secondary marketplace and have people also trading. That's pretty cool. Whereas Reg D, there's going to be a 12 month lockup period in most cases. So same deal. If I'm raising capital, I at least need to lock these people up for 12 months before I could even list and have things trade. So that's just one of the stipulations you could code in or have the service provider, the transfer agent 
um, kind of take care of it for you. That way you're not breaking anything. And as the fund manager, I could put restrictions. Like if I don't want anyone selling more than 5% in a quarter, I could also bake that in. It's just more efficient because I won't have to manage or worry about any of that. It'll all be kind of locked and loaded um, just on the technology side. Yeah. So, and you're thinking really, you, you know, I know Jamie from Securitize, so mm-hmm. obviously we follow their business uh, closely. It was really just the, you know, last year that they started to get the secondary offerings available. But re- so, you know, give a bit of insight into, you know, I know T0, the Alto Markets, I know there's a few other ATSs opening up out there. But what's your overview of the ATS market right now, these alternative trading systems? And then I know there's a lot of primary offerings coming out. So when are they going to become secondary offerings? And at what point do you see the market sort of exploding? Yeah. So, I mean, just from what we've seen uh, on our advisory side and everything, a lot, like we mentioned before, a lot of these are being done as Reg D offerings. So minimum 12-month lockup periods, let's say, was it March right now? Let's say we've seen a ton of projects all throughout 2022. It, it sounds like a cop out answer, but it very well could take until like mid 2024 for a lot of these to actively be trading on ATSs. My guess, and from what I've been hearing, is that um, a number of primary projects have signed with ATSs, but probably can't trade till later this year, just given that lockup period. If they were raising capital in 2022, which we saw a lot of projects do. Um, so I really see, but I've also heard, you know, there's uh, from the ATSs, there's a number of new listings, probably one off over the next couple quarters. Let's call it quarter two and quarter three. Um, I think the primary side is still where a lot of the firepower is lying. And I think um, a lot of the, you know, one of the key things in, in the industry right now is distribution on the primary side to find good buyers, to find capital willing to come into these deals. And, you know, the macro picture just kind of short, you know, just kind of put a, a cap on some of those. It just made it a bit tougher. Um, but to really answer the question, yes, I think like when you look at the ATSs right now, the alternative trading systems that have active trading, it's really a T0, uh, INX and securitized markets. But also the other, like there's a number of approved ATSs. And so we have Rialto markets. We do have Oasis Pro markets. We have Abe Global. They should be coming live in the next couple of quarters. Um, we have Templum markets who could do analog and digital offerings. We do have a number of them. Um, I'm sure they have some listings coming soon. It's really a matter of just kind of getting agreements done and actively listing. And I know some of the ATSs want, you know, more onboarded buyers before they actually go live as well, um, just to make sure their order books look pretty good because it is kind of tough on the secondary side to incentivize a lot of trading without like derivatives, without true market makers to, to hold books. So it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a battle, but you know, organically should do a trick, but also um, bringing more traditional parties and like market making side to come help that will be a big key. So if you think of what happened with sort of FTX and now the sort of problems with the current banking crisis and, you know, and I always speak to people about, the sort of tokenization, you've got to think of a bit like a tech stock, you know, it's just out there, it moves up and down with the markets. But, you know, with everything that's happening out there in the financial markets, and obviously we're going through a downturn, which makes it, you know, more difficult time for the buy-in of what's happening out there, but you're seeing growth anyway. How is this actually affecting the market? And do you actually see at the back end of this is actually going to help the, the tokenization process and whole market space because of the transparency involved? Yeah, I definitely do. That was kind of our thesis too. Like a lot of you know, a lot of our team members at Secure Token Market, Secure Token Advisors, um, think the a lot of the cryptocurrencies will be deemed securities. Like I said earlier, whether you are very pro crypto, more traditional finance, at the end of the day, the SEC is going to have its call on a lot of these. Um, and it's just you know, it's 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 more likely than not that a handful of these normal cryptos will be deemed securities. So where are they going to list? They probably can't list on the typical exchanges that you deal with day to day. FTX, the blow up actually accelerated what we were seeing because to your point, Alistair, a lot of clients of ours and even just conversations say, wow, let's double down on the security token side. Let's work with a T0, a Securitize, um, a Rialto to make sure we are working with a registered broker dealer. Um, Right now, Coinbase has, you know, its own stuff going on, but they do have a broker dealer license. Gemini 
does have Gemini Galactic Markets, which is an ATS license. So I think a lot of the exchanges, the traditional ones were, sorry, traditional, the crypto exchanges were preparing for this type of future. Um, but when you look at it, you even have like Prometheum ATS, who is an ATS designed to list cryptocurrencies that get deemed security, security. So um, when you look at it that way, I think, you know, if you're going to, if you're launching a crypto, a digital asset, you're going to probably think twice and put more emphasis on the security compliance side, which positions a lot of these broker dealers pretty well. Yeah, because I think a fear for a lot of people is there's so many of these ATSs popping up now, and a lot of them are either going to, you know, are they going to have like, and it's like a lot of the crypto exchanges, once you go outside the top, say, 10 or 15, essentially you've got, I don't know, the last time I checked, there's like over a thousand crypto exchanges now, so it's like, and a lot of them have no volume on it. So is this going to be a point where there'll be a lot of these ATSs coming up, and then maybe the big ones, T0, Securitize, and then Coinbase might open one, and even the NASDAQ might end up opening a, some form of ATS as well, and maybe a few of these things. Is it just this point whereby now the floodgates are open, so there's a lot of ATS is opening, do you, but you think the market will solidify behind a few? Uh, I don't think there will be a lot of ATSs coming because it's hard to get that license specifically. Like On the crypto exchange side, we saw a ton pop up over five years because it's really just tech. You just need the infrastructure. You don't need the licensing. Um, whereas in on the ATS side, that's one of the most difficult licenses to get. Um, you know, if we're going like transfer agent, broker dealer, special purpose broker dealer and ATS, that's kind of the difficulty range. Um, and so when you even look at the space, like some ATSs have what's called like an, an enhanced ATS license, a digital enhanced, so they can support analog uh, securities and uh, kind of like tokenized securities, whereas others are digitally native ATSs. So they actually could support like digital 1940 act fund share classes. And this nuance isn't talked about a lot outside of the actual service providers who know the jargon themselves, but it will be something very important. Um, I would say a couple of years from now, when we do see more secondary listings, when people realize, wow, I issued my product with so-and-so, it's really a digitally enhanced product, not a digitally native product. And that will kind of dictate what ATS you're allowed to play with and, and trade on. Um, but that's just one nuance. I think in terms of the ATS side, I, I would love to see NASDAQ get into the game. They already do have NASDAQ private market and NPM, um, which is just doing a lot of, you know, VC backed private company share trading. Um, like think of like series C and up. Um, they very well could do this with security tokens or with tokenization. We have like ClearList, who is a, an ATS for private securities. They could do similar. We already saw London Stock Exchange Group's private marketplace spin out. They're one step away from tokenization. So a lot of these incumbent names could, in theory, do this. And all it takes, yeah, like you said, Alex, are buying out an ATS with a license or something similar like that. Yeah. So really, for the market to you know to take full effect, you probably need one of these bigger players in addition to come in because then they would bring a lot of product into the market as well obviously sure. well we thought that with t0 being backed by by ice intercontinental exchange which owns the new york stock exchange and a number of other companies um but again to the question before a lot of the primary offerings are still locked up so we ne haven't necessarily saw the you know 50 new listings on t0 ats that everyone was hoping for whether that's a factor of just the lockup period or of the raw product is is to be seen but um yeah i mean i have to assume if if one of these big firms are really getting in they have a number of clients who are ready to issue tokenized products and that will kind of be the sweep yeah and it's uh, i remember jamie security speaking to me about it before and you know he saw you know 22 23 is you know people are now seeing more of it 24 start getting adoption 25 26 and then from then onwards that the, you know the last the 20s coming there mass adoption of what this technology is about to do because of the benefits for it so you took you spoke a little bit about tokenization of equity explain to people how you can do tokenization of debt and how that works sure i'm pretty similarly we see a lot uh, a lot we see a growing number of um real estate debt products so companies who want it like robin land is a cool example um, we even see clients on the STA side and they're just issuing debt products backed by real estate. So rather than getting the upside 
um, of the equity, maybe you get fixed distributions or even variable distributions with cash flows on top of a fixed percentage. Um, but that's more like a retail example. Honestly, on the debt side, the coolest and the most telling to me is even looking at what all the investment banks are doing. Back in like 2019, let's say Goldman Sachs helped European Investment Bank and Societe Generale raise capital for a blockchain based bond issuance. Fast forward a couple of years and say 2021, Goldman's becoming a little more involved, a little more active, um, kind of announcing a pilot program with their own internal uh, system and then working with like HQLAX, who does a lot of this tokenization, enterprise tokenization for investment banks. Now, 2022, 2023, Goldman announces Goldman Sachs DAP, Digital Assets Platform. And they're issuing their own bonds. They're, or they're issuing you know, bond tokenization as a service, essentially, and kind of giving their full backing to it. The way I see that trajectory is that they, they kind of see money in the water. They smell blood and they're ready to capture that um, because a lot of investment banks are now issuing debt products on chain. Why? It's pretty easy. We can issue this. We could get into a bunch of different groups, either at our bank, the issuing bank, um, other banks, other buyers, or even clients that were issuing it on their behalf, corporate clients. Um, we could fix any uh, coupon rates, whether variable or fixed, right into the smart contract, like we mentioned before with the lockup periods. You could code it right in or call it via API. If you have different benchmarks to reach, you could call those in, boom, manage it without any real middle office work. Um, and then anything from the management side and then future trading and swaps is pretty, pretty seamless. And so that's a whole big use case for a lot of the banks. Um, and so that's kind of just simply on the bond side, but even on like the structured product side, which could be a mortgage backed security with 12 different tranches, all debt products, managing that, that whole capital stack on chain is so much more seamless than having an analyst group manage all those different tranches, the different terms, the stipulations, the timelines, the maturities, and then pricing on the market. So like when that gets unlocked, which there's a couple of companies already working on that, when that gets unlocked more, that's where I see a lot of institutional capital flowing into. Yeah, that's super interesting. I think the the financial market sides of getting involved will be, I think, will be the key behind the whole thing going forward. You know, because you know our company, we tokenized the first well interest in America. We tokenized the first wells. We, you know, did this piece of it, and then we wrote this white paper, finance infrastructure and blockchain based tokenization. It's had a, like a thousand downloads now. Particularly looking at oil and gas market, which is an old industry. So you think about going into that and then really the problem is it's adoption within that industry. So, you know, when I've been involved in this, I see the benefits for it. And if you think for like the big operators, so, you know, I've, I've pitched to Shell, Saudi Aramco, BP, all of them, what we're doing, they like the idea and they keep saying, oh, we're a bit early in the days for us to do something like that. But if you think of like an oil project, uh, you know, the big oil companies, they've got, you know, they're worth billions of dollars, but the money's all locked into the life cycle of the project. It's all right. locked into the capital of the project. So they might have a project that's worth, you know, $200 billion, but essentially it's only making this profit and all the money's locked into the capital. So they have to pass this project on, you know, I'm from Scotland, so this would happen in the North Sea a lot. You'd have BP and Shell running mm -hmm. the big projects and then they would pass it on to say a smaller entity like Apache or someone like that. You know, you might not know who these guys are, but they're big in the oil industry. Mm -hmm. But that process could take two, three years to pass on the asset and it's all work from percentages. So, you know, and I just see this technology allowing them to pass on assets a lot faster, but unlocking liquidity. So can you explain to people for, you know, for the viewers who are trying to, you know, get their head around this, not in the financial sector, but going into physical assets, the benefits of unlocking liquidity uh, in assets right now through tokenization? Yeah, I think, wow, one thing I didn't even touch on with the, let's say, the fund manager and the real estate side is, um, look at like the fair market value of private securities. You're probably going to have to, if you're looking to unload, you're probably going to have to take a big discount, maybe 10, maybe 20, even 30%, um, you know, discount just for your liquidity premium, just to find a buyer, which could take six to nine to 12 months typically, and then transfer that and the legal work behind it. Um, that's a pretty big hit when you think about things. So even in this case, when things become a bit more cumbersome, um, 
when your token is when you're tokenizing the whole pinnacles that I could do things more peer to peer and simpler. So all you need, if you have assets that are tokenized, you could find spin up a bulletin board or some sort of marketplace, and at least find more efficiencies there. Even if you save five, 10 percent on the actual transacting price, if that's close to the fair market value, you're already doing pretty well. Um, I think the whole idea is like just digitization. And that's no different from having um, just kind of online marketplaces spin up over the past 20 years. Right. And the whole idea is to connect buyers and sellers in a more efficient and better manner. That's kind of where things are spinning to these days. So as you get a bit more niche uh, and have real buyers onboarded to these certain platforms, that's where a lot of these benefits are then seen. I think the difficult part right now is that things are still very fragmented. Um, so only people who are looking for security token offerings are going to really find them. Whereas when people start just associating private assets with tokenization and with like the, the T-zeros and the securitizes, that's when... I think a lot more capital or potential capital will onboard and will at least have their eyes looking frequently at these types of listings. And that's when you have, you know, even the shells, big corporations looking to figure out how they could leverage this internally, even um, and that's kind of where a lot of this could be unlocked. And we, we have these conversations with corporations looking to do things internally, not public facing, but rather using the technology uh, from like a trade finance perspective or just kind of internal settlement and transfer that's another huge use case that people don't really see because it's not really a public uh, a public offering. Yeah, and you know, I think um, JPM Coin, you know, um, great example. So explain, you know, but I don't know. You I, you could try and explain what how it actually works because I don't I don't know anyone actually knows sure. yet this out with, but for you know that's a massive institution and then i know from your um what's dripping newsletter as well you had something about blackrock last week as well so these are like two massive players in the space that everyone knows of how are they getting involved in digital securities and what are their thought process on this yeah so jp jpm coin jpmc came up in 2018 at the time, I had no idea what it was for. I was like, is this trying to become a new Bitcoin? I think everyone had the same question. What exactly is the purpose here? Uh, fast forward four years to 2022, it became a lot more pertinent. Um, considering that JPM coin is the settlement token of everything that JP Morgan's Onyx division, which is their blockchain division, does. So Onyx has, for example, they have a blockchain-based repo network. Uh, Goldman Sachs has joined, BNY Mellon, BNP Paribas, a lot of other banks and corporations have joined the network to basically use JPM's technology to transfer um, money markets, cash, cash equivalent, whatever, for repo, repurchase agreement uh, operations. And so I think it launched in November 2020. It's already done $430 billion worth of volume. Every transaction that happens settles with JPM coins. So you really see where it comes into play. Because if you had to settle in US dollar, eventually you'd have to move off the blockchain rails to fiat. And that would make no sense because that would take the whole purpose off. It's like a train having to go somewhere, but wait, we have to jump off the tracks real quick to pick up passengers. It's not simply going to happen. Um, so it kind of serves that point. And then even JPM's like tokenized collateral network, which is where they're taking their repo side and kind of opening up to more alternative assets, to a, a wide range of Forex and, and foreign currencies, whatever, to then transfer around their banking parties um, for collateral purposes, which is very cool. You mentioned BlackRock as well. The, so Larry Fink mentioned that in one of their main focuses is tokenization of assets, especially bonds and equities. Um, there's actually a company, Ondo Finance, who spun up you know special purpose per, special purpose vehicles like we mentioned before bought a bunch of blackrock and pimco money market and kind of treasury funds issued tokens on those spvs um and accepted buyers via usd usdc which is usd stablecoin um so that's pretty cool and the whole motivation there was to rotate stablecoin holders who were not generating any yield really um into these yield generating money market funds fully on chain and so that was all that was very cool to see they even rolled out flux finance which is like a collateralization platform for these money market funds on chain now to borrow against in a collateralization standpoint um and that's cool because that's a very DeFi approach but all with regulated compliant um traditional products 
Um, so that's kind of the extent, at least, of what BlackRock was looking at. And then we have other, like I mentioned, Goldman before. A lot of the banks are doing this together, uh, mostly on the debt side, the fixed income side. But then we have asset managers like Franklin Templeton and Wisdom Tree offering their own tokenized products and kind of consumer apps and platforms. And I'm aware of a number of others that I won't mention that are doing similarly. So it's it's extremely powerful to look at the asset managers and investment banks alike. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So it's been super interesting getting on, Peter. It's just, and it will give a bit of insight. You know, we've only had Peter on for like 45 minutes, everybody. But, you know, you go to their websites, they're doing, you know, providing a lot of information on that. So as we wrap up the podcast, Peter, could you want to give a little bit more information about what the company's doing, where they can find out about yourself and Kyle and Herwig and everyone else? Definitely. Yeah. So stm.co, security token market, stm.co is. Um, you know, our site, we have a lot of the secondary trading data. We have all the news and media coming out. We do have the security token show just for weekly headlines and kind of developments every Monday. I do a lot of the deep research on the security token advisor side. We're going to be offering this through our STA success network to really connect the industry more because that's really what's needed. I mentioned fragmentation a couple of times. Um, so bringing issuers, asset managers, legal groups, platform service providers, blockchains, and kind of third-party services and data providers all together under one roof with our insights is the whole goal there. Make it super, super interactive and kind of all-encompassing. Um, that could also be found at securitytokenadvisors.com, which was our advisory research side. Um, but yeah, I mean, every we're coming out with a Q1 report shortly, um, looking at real-world assets, looking at all the major players here. And we kind of have our, our ear to the floor on this, you know, just to to connect the dots on behalf of issuers and, and platforms alike. Pretty active on LinkedIn as well. It's Peter Gaffney with the, the palm tree after it. You'll see it. And that's kind of the where I'm spitting out all this. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And I, th- you know, and I think for other people out there, just even getting your newsletter every week, it's a great way of just like getting the link updates and stuff like that. You know, I'm always reading the newsletter that's sent out to me and it's oh, definitely. it's definitely been the leader in the space. And it's amazing to think from where it started in 2018 that now we're suddenly speaking about Goldman Sachs, BlackRock, all these guys getting involved, you know? Well, it's, it's cool to see even from our advisory side, just the types of clients that have kind of went this way from dealing with, you know, smaller real estate funds and novelty cases, carbon credits to half trillion dollar asset managers and kind of global, you know, market makers on that front. It's very cool. And it's just validation for the whole industry. Mm. Perfect. So, well, thanks very much. I appreciate our busy guy, Peter. So thanks very much for coming on the show today. Thanks for the invite, Alistair. This is great. It's fantastic. No, no, no problem at all. And we'll, we'll look to get you back on in the future as well so we can t- help educate our viewers about the security token market space. Definitely. Let me know. Okay, that's great. Well, thanks very much for everyone out there. Uh, my name's Alistair Caithness. You've been watching Boom, it's on the blockchain. Have a nice day. <laughs>